they come out, get a tray of food, and then take it back into their room. Hold on, pause. Wait a minute. You can't eat no food in your goddamn room. You gonna give us roaches. May James Holler told Unsung that when Mary told her she was going to marry Cecil, she started laughing. I thought she was kidding, partly because Cecil was 19 and Mary was 23. Cecil practically forced me to marry him, Mary said years later. You don't know what type of person I am. You can practically stay on me long enough and I'll do almost anything. Wells claimed Cecil was so forceful. He had me walking down the aisle without me even knowing how I got down there. She had reservations she could barely hide on a day of her wedding ceremony, which took place at Olivet Institutional Church in Cleveland in August 1966. In the church dressing room that day, Murray told her friend May, I don't want to go through with this. I really want to get the hell out of here and run and never look back. May replied, it's your choice because it's your life. All you've got to do is get up and walk out of here. But Mary pointed out, all his family is out there. My family is out there. How in the world am I going to get out of this? Summing up this second marriage, Mary said shortly before her death that I asked the Lord because I had been very lonely to please send me someone to love. I think it was supposed to have been Curtis. But he sent me Cecil. Whatever her reservations, one of Wells' major motivations for her marrying was to have children, as she had told her BFF, May James Holler, a few years before. That was one thing dear to her heart, May said. Cecil Womack and Wells remained married for 11 years and had three children. Cecil Demetrius Womack Jr., named after his father, and now known professionally as Meech Wells, born December 29, 1967, followed in 1969 by Stacy Womack, their only daughter, now known as Noel Wells, and on February 10, 1975, by Harry James George Womack, now known as Shorty Wells. He was named Harry James after his uncle who had been stabbed to death by his girlfriend in 1974. Yeah, we read about that story. Ooh, that thing was so sad and tragic. When we read the uh, Bobby Womack book, ooh, that thing was so tragic. During her long interview with Steve Bergsman, Mary spent much of her time telling him how little she loved Cecil and how bad their marriage was. Bergsman found this difficult to believe considering the length of their marriage and the number of children they had. Well, you can get pregnant without enjoying it, especially if you're a breeder. She noted that her grandmother had had 22 children. When Bergsman pointed out that she was married to Cecil for 11 years, she responded, I was with Curtis for 13 years. Mm, 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 mm. That's heartbreaking now. I mean, if I ain't never heard the foo shenanigans before, I, I, I didn't heard it right now today. I was married to you for 11 years, but I was with your brother for 13. What kind of, that bitch is a G. Will said Cecil dominated her after marriage, just as he had during their courtship. His love was so overbearing that I couldn't talk to anybody. As Bergsman continued, to question her, Mary finally admitted, I loved, I learned to love Cecil, but I learned to dislike him too because he was extremely jealous. Why in the fuck? Again, another extremely jealous person. What is wrong with Mary Wells that every dude she get with is jealous? It's, it's like unfathomable to me how she just keeps bumping into this kind of guy. Mary said the honeymoon was over on its second day when her friend Ida, a model, and Ida's husband, a movie producer, came over to visit the newlyweds. I was sure the husband had eyes for me. Again, another thing. Mary think everybody want her. Want some of the Mary. 
God damn. I was sure the husband had eyes for me, but I never gave him any come on. I just treated him nice, she said. Then Cecil started flirting with his wife, but told Murray not to talk to the husband. I said, if you're going to talk to her and flirt with her, and this man's just talking to me like, Mary, I would like to do a production of you for the movies or television in a business way. He wasn't flirting. Cecil allegedly replied, you don't need to be around people. I have to be very careful with you being around people because you're like a kid. You don't even know when someone's flirting with you. After this, Murray said, Cecil usually made it clear without words that she couldn't talk to any other people, especially men. It was the way he reacted when I spoke to others. The look on his face, the fear I would feel. You don't talk to any men. You don't talk to any women. You don't talk to anybody. Some of this may have been in play when Mary, Cecil, and their children moved back to Los Angeles from Florida and stayed with Cecil's brother, Friendly Jr., and Friendly's then wife, Sally, in that couple's three-bedroom apartment. According to Friendly, all Mary and Cecil would do was stay in their room rather than look for another place to live or communicate with anyone. They'd come out, get a tray of food, and then take it back into their room. Hold on, pause. Wait a minute. You can't eat no food in your goddamn room. You gonna give us roaches. They stayed with Friendly and Sally for a year, Sally said. Finally, under pressure from Sally, Friendly found an apartment for them and suggested they move into it, which they did. Sally Womack noticed some other oddities about their life. Whenever one of them went to use the bathroom, she said, the other one would go into the bathroom also. Uh-oh. Them Cancers and Virgos relationships be like that child. Them motherfuckers can't take a dump without each other. And when she was cleaning up after the couple and their children had left, Sally found pampas that had been soiled by Harry hanging in their room. Short on funds, Mary and Cecil planned to reuse the clean pampers after they had dried. So let me tell you the rules in my family. Child, oh my goodness. You're going to be like, your family is nuts, Nate, but it's okay. It was very few of us among the first cousins that could actually use pampers. Okay, I think my sister could. I think my cousin Yaya could. I'm not sure who ever else, but most of us were allergic to pampers so we all had to wear the cloth diapers okay so that would mean that you would have to shake the doo-doo out in the toilet and wash them out by hand you know and hang them to dry not like the mug of reusable pampers that the mary wells was doing because my family wasn't too happy about how allergic all of us was because you know all my aunts were underage when they had all grew up in this big house on Bonham, okay, Bonham Street, Northwest. In one room would be me and my mom. In another room would be my Aunt Wee Wee and Honey. And in another room would be uh, my Aunt Crystal and Mick and Danny, okay? And because most of us were allergic, the rule was you had to be out of diapers by one. You had to be potty trained by one because what nobody gonna be washing the shit off your ass after that one years old that was it and that stuff still carries on to this frigging day you hear me i got second and third cousins that are pushed out of their diapers or or pampers because the mamas don't want to be washing shit off the children's ass after one well said that when she was home and Cecil went out somewhere mentally without him telling me, I knew I was supposed to stay in the house, maybe in the bedroom. She admitted, though, that after a while, I got used to it. I think I liked it. Mary may have been able to tolerate or perhaps enjoy the home life she described with Cecil because she retained her professional life. She needed to do so to help pay the family bills. Although she took some time off after she had her second child, she soon began performing as a singer again on stage and in clubs, 
on a regular basis. She said, however, that she did this over Cecil's resistance. He didn't really want me to work or be an entertainer, she said. He was supposed to help me with my career, but he put it into a slump. Cecil Womack did not respond to request for an interview for this book. Uh-oh, you, know, you know, every time a request is denied, the Emma Effa is dealing with guilt and they don't want those moments to be rehashed. Mary's charges that Cecil wanted her to stay at home all the time and didn't want her to resume her singing career may be an attempt to rewrite her personal history because of the guilt she felt later over the eventual failure of the marriage. Her criticism ignores Cecil's attempts to help her develop her career at Atlantic Records and at her next company, Jubilee Records, as well as the work he put into co-writing and producing many of her songs and arranging many of her performance dates. Okay, I told you, Mary Wells is nuts. It's like she strategically forgets things in order for her to continuously be the victim. I see you, Mary Wells. It also ignores the energy Cecil put into backing her on stage with his bass guitar. It's nice to have his guitar behind me, Murray told the British publication Melody Maker in 1967. Along with all his other contributions, Cecil also set up a music publishing firm called Well Wom, through which he marketed the couple's jointly written tunes many of them labeled as written by CNM Womack or Cecil and Mary Womack. Many music fans, in fact, refer to Cecil Womack and Murray Wells as the first Womack and Womack. Cecil and his second wife, Linda Cook, the daughter of Sam Cook, became the second Womack and Womack. Mary okay. always insisted that even though Cecil was not faithful to her during their marriage, she remained faithful to him until Curtis came back into her life. Cecil has told interviewers he was faithful to Mary. Meanwhile, her professional pride and her financial needs required her to make another stab at recapturing her former popularity as a singer. At Jubilee Records, to which she moved, in the spring of 1968, after leaving Atlantic, Mary was determined to break her post-Motown pattern of one or two pop hits followed by a decline. And as most people familiar with Wells' recording history would expect by now, the first Wells tune released by Jubilee was a hit. The Doctor, released in 1968, reached number 22 on the Billboard R&B charts. Number 65 on the Billboard Pop Chart and number 79 on the Cash Box Pop Chart. On the B-side of The Doctor is the Mary and Cecil song, Two Lovers History. Jubilee pleased at the success of The Doctor soon released an album of Wells tunes called Serving Up Some Soul, which contains The Doctor and 13 other songs. Unfortunately, not only did the album fail to chart, none of the 13 non-Doctor tunes recorded on it did either. Meaning that Mary's post-Motown up and down recording pattern was continuing with a vengeance. In 1969, Mary's career seemed like it might lift on yet another updraft when Jubilee released Mind Reader, backed with Never Give a Man the World. While Mind Reader completely failed to chart, Never Give a Man the World, while not making a dent on any pop chart, rose to number 38 on the R&B chart. The next year, Jubilee released Sweet Love, backed with The Driving It Must Be, both of which also failed to hit any chart. Although Jubilee had been planning a second album for Mary, originally titled Come Together and later titled Love and Tranquility, most of the singles planned for it that the company already had released had done so badly that Jubilee canceled the album. It wasn't 
released until after Wells' death. Competition in black music certainly had increased since the time when Wells was among the few active soloists on the distaff side of the genre. By 1970, companies such as Stax and Atlantic were producing soul sisters in mass. The underlying problem, however, was that although Mary did very well as a vocalist on much of the Jubilee material, she and Cecil were no match for Smokey Robinson in the songwriter category. Wells also had another explanation for her post-Motown decline, telling friends she might be on some sort of blacklist because Gordy was still angry at her for endangering Motown's early success. I don't think Barry Gordy has really forgiven me for leaving the company, she told author Sharon Davis in the late 1980s. It has been a long time, but he hasn't forgotten. I have tried to speak to him, but he will not speak to me. Wells was so discouraged by her performance at Jubilee that she left in 1970, announcing that she would cut back on recording and concentrate on giving live singing performances and being a wife and a mother. I'd lost faith in record companies, she said later. Nevertheless, Murray was a prolific performer and helped keep the family afloat with her concert earnings. Cecil was also employed by various record companies. At first, that didn't mean giving up recording completely. After leaving Jubilee, Murray did three recordings for Warner Reprise on separate contracts. She recorded no future records until 1981, but continued performing. Unfortunately, many of Mary's post-Motown concerts were underfunded, and she often was nearly broke. That may help explain an incident Tony Russi recounted. Baby, you say that you love me. 